Hello, I'm Sahar Hunaidi. Welcome to Podcasts for Life. Sadhguru, it's a great pleasure to meet you today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. Um, you've been described as a visionary humanitarian. Uh, do you believe that's a correct description of you? <laughs> that's what people would like to say. <laughs> Every human being describes everything in his life the way they know it. The value of uh, human consciousness has not been realized by people. Mm -hmm. So, a small outcome of that, which expresses itself in the form of social activity, is what people can see. So, from that context, they are calling me a humanitarian. That sounds… for me, it sounds like that I'm a cannibal or something, a humanitarian, a vegetarian, a (laughs) non-vegetarian, a humanitarian (laughs) That sounds like a cannibal to me, I'm not that. (laughs) <laughs> well, what's the essence of your teaching? What, what is it you're trying to uh, teach people? There's really no teaching as such. It is just methods, technology of enhancing life to its ultimate possibility. So, I have no teaching, no philosophy, no belief system. We just have a proper technology as to how to enhance an individual life to its ultimate possibility. So, you could say your goal is to enhance people's consciousness? Sort of, yes (laughs) Not just consciousness, everything. His physicality, his mentality, his inner nature, all of it, to enhance all of it. And you talk about techniques, I understand yoga is one of the techniques that you use. Is that the most important? Technique is a, I would say an improper description. It is a whole science and technology. As there is a science and technology to create external well-being, there is a whole science and technology to create inner well-being. So, generally that technology may be passing off as yoga, but what needs to be understood is In the Western world, the word yoga means, uh, you know, impossible physical postures or now uh, people are saying, okay, holding your breath is also yoga. That's not what it is though, yoga means a means. Yoga means everything is yoga. Now what we are teaching as Isha Yoga does not mean any particular thing. The very way you sit is yoga, Mm -hmm. the way you breathe is yoga, the way you speak is yoga, the way you work is yoga, the way you walk is yoga, the very way you exist itself is yoga. Or in other words, making use of all the aspects of life, everything that you do in your life. You ask me, what's a breakfast? Everything you eat. Breakfast or lunch or dinner or bath Mm -hmm. or whatever you do, everything can be used as a means to either grow, move towards your liberation or as a means to get entangled. Generally, it is the simple activity of life through which people are getting all entangled and muddled up. The same can be used as a means towards your liberation. So yoga does not exclude any aspect of life, everything. If you do it consciously, the way it works towards your well-being and enhancement, that's called yoga. Okay, so you mentioned before that uh, you were working within people's understanding of… when I asked you whether you're a humanitarian… No, 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 I didn't mean I'm working, I definitely don't work within human understanding, people's understanding. I work way beyond people's understanding, that's my work. It is just that people label you according to their understanding. Yes. They call me a humanitarian. That sounds like diet. Well, I really <laughs> wondered… Yes, I really wondered whether uh, you, you had different teachings for people at different levels of consciousness or understanding. Or do people need dif- a different guidance? On different… Path? No different teachings, as I said, no teachings. Mm. Different methods, yes, Mm. each individual needs a different method. When I say a different method, see what you call as a human being is fundamentally these four ingredients. Mm -hmm. Your physical body, your mind, your emotion and the energy that makes all these things happen. These are the four ingredients with which every human being is made. But every human being is a unique composition of these four ingredients. 
So, for every human being you need a proper mix of these four. For these four dimensions, which are experientially true for you, we have four basic yogas. Yoga of intelligence, yoga of devotion, yes. yoga of action, yoga of transforming energies. Mm -hmm. These are known as bhakti yoga, gnana yoga, karma yoga and kriya yoga. So everything that is life is covered within this because everything that you do is either with the body or with the intellect or with the emotion or with your energy. This is all a human being can do. So for all these four dimensions, there are four basic yogas. So the reason why constantly the Eastern systems have always insisted on a live guru is because he will mix the right concoction of these four for each individual. Because the yoga that I give you, if I give it to another person, it will not work because you are one kind of composition, he is another kind of composition. The reason why a lot of people have this experience of their spirituality not working for them is because they're taking a common prescription. You, you don't think it's m that actually that they're misguided and that they're following a set of instructions which has perhaps become obvious. See, first of all, instructions are not happening in an experiential way because dedication is a very scarce material in the world today, very hard to find that. Mm. So, the subjective processes of life were always handled by very dedicated people who held it above their life, not as a part of their life, not as a profession or a hobby, but above their life. Only such people transmitted spiritual processes in ancient past. But today on the street corner they want to do it without any commitment in a very I mean, it's been… it's become more of a commerce than spirituality. So, because of this, it gets all misinterpreted, misunderstood and definitely leading to variety of problems. And above all, beginning to think that it doesn't work. So, one basic thing that we have done is to re-establish that dedication in people. The whole organization is one hundred percent dedicated volunteers. Mm. So, there are over fourteen hundred full-time volunteers with us and over almost half a million part-time volunteers with us. So, it is done by them and even to teach a simple three-day program, they go through three to four years of very intense training, full-time training. Such things are totally missing. See, now if you want to qualify yourself as a physician, you have to dedicate at least eight to ten years of your life. Yes. But in three weeks or three weekends, you can become a yoga teacher. People are giving certificates for yes, that. Yes. So, because of this lack of… Uh, and to become a spiritual teacher, you don't need to do anything. If you read half a book, you can become a spiritual teacher. By a soapbox and yes. microphone. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> you just need a microphone and a loud speaker <laughs> But um, do you think there are any particular problems with… Um, I say the world society today because we've we've increasingly got become a, a global culture. Do you think there are any particular aspects of life which make it difficult for individuals? One thing is uh, people have lived uh, with a certain identity. See, about hundred, hundred fifty years ago, not everybody on this planet belonged to some country. People just lived on this planet, living with tribal, ethnic, racial, religious identities. But in the last hundred and fifty years, we sort of put everybody into some kind of national identity, believing that's going to be better than ethnic and whatever, but it created more wars and more clashes than ever before. Now because of technology, the national borders have become porous because of the kind of economics that is happening around the world. Uh, you don't know where you are, you're English but you're working in India, your wife mm. is Italian, your children are in America. Mm. <laughs> this is the reality for lots of people. So, after some time, your Englishness or Indianness or whatever doesn't stick so hard on you anymore. So, to maintain an identity, there's a whole sphere of things from the clothes that you wear to language that you speak, the food that you eat, the kind of people you interact with, all these are needed to nurture a certain identity which is gone now. But still human beings need some kind of an identity. So these identities we have always… if you grow into a certain level of consciousness, you can live beyond identity. But to maintain a certain social… Uh, psychological framework, 
most human beings need a certain identity till they grow to a certain dimension of consciousness within themselves. So for this, if we can… we have never nurtured these identities in a large way. We have always nurtured narrower identities because these identities were nurtured by those people who have political goals. Always identities were nurtured with political goals. Right from your school days, you're being told you're English or I've been told that I'm Indian or somebody's being told there's something else because they know someday if your country goes to war with somebody, you need a strong identity to raise with emotion and go. Otherwise, you'll just wonder, why should I go? So these identities are, are basically being control mechanisms. Yes, they're the definitely con not only control mechanisms, they're also a way of holding a certain psychological framework. A human being needs to, you know, he can't just live in open space, they're not there yet. Unless he raises to a certain level of understanding and experience, he can't simply live out in the open, he needs some framework. So what kind of framework? These frameworks have not been created in a very conscious way towards human well-being. They have been done with political goals. Precisely. So I have been striving to bring this in various fora that uh, why don't we first education-wise make it compulsory everywhere in the world to bring a global identity. For example, why is it that we have not even thought of this? Every country is singing their own national anthem. Isn't it time we sang a global anthem, praising the beauty of this planet and the life on this planet, rather than going on saying, my country is beautiful, my people are beautiful, why can't we just sing a global anthem? I think it should happen, a global anthem must happen, isn't it? That's a very good idea, I think it, it would work particularly well in London. So. <laughs> Within this larger identity, there would be room for every small identity. You could still be English, mm. you could still be Christian, Hindu, Muslim, whatever. In a larger identity, you hold yourself. Within that, you have much variety and scope. Now, there will be still color in life. We are not trying to make everything uniform. That will take off all the color in the world. It's okay to have multiple identities. But if you hold people in a larger framework of identity, the need for conflict and the possibility of conflict can be brought down. It cannot be eliminated, still there are issues, but it could be brought down. Instantly it won't get ignited. When you sit here as English and me as Indian, smallest thing can ignite. If we sit here with a global identity, we can look at issues as issues. So you focus on people as people rather than yes. members of a political entity? Not even as people, we, we re really need to look at ourselves as just life. Mm. Because uh, just protecting the people is no more important, we are beginning to understand that, isn't it, in a very hard way <laughs> well, Protecting the world is protecting the people. Right? Life. <laughs> life. And is this why there's such an international dimension to the work that you've done recently, why you travel so much? Because this message needs to go out to all countries, not just to India or England or… Personally, as far as I'm concerned, the whole idea of many countries is just… Uh, it's just quite uh, childish and silly, actually. It's just that we've invested so much, today it may look like what I'm saying may look like out of the world kind of thing. But personally for me, it looks quite funny that uh, we're splitting the world into so many parts, 169 parts and saying, this is mine, this is yours. <laughs> looks funny to me. You can't cut the air that you breathe. What the Indians exhale, you're inhaling in England probably, mm. isn't it? <laughs> Why have we carved up the land like this? This has all come from a certain psychology of insecurity. People have constantly lived in insecurity. This insecurity has come because people have not transcended their fundamental survival instinct. They're still there. There are two dimensions to every human being. One aspect of you is the survival instinct which rules everything. For certain functionality, for administration, we could divide. But now it is… it is there deeply embedded in human mind and heart, isn't it? My country right or wrong? Is, uh, huh? My country right or wrong? Yes. Yes, yes. yes it's a, an old paradigm, I think, that's, that's <laughs> lost <now. laughs> No, that is coming from an essential aspect of self-preservation. The instinct of self-preservation is ruling people still. 
if your instinct of self-preservation is ruling you, there's no question of rays of consciousness, such a possibility doesn't arise. Because these two forces are constantly in you. One is trying to preserve, another wants to expand in a boundless way. Both are functional within the human being. Which one you empower is the question which decides what kind of a human being you are. If you empower your self-preservation, you will naturally build walls around yourself, not realizing the walls that you build for self-protection are also the walls of self-imprisonment. So, so if you have a fear-based view of the world, then you will basically imprison yes. yourself. Yes, you'll make more smaller and smaller boundaries as days go by. But if you, presumably, I don't know whether you use the word love, but if you are open to all the world and all the life that's in the world, then you have a completely different... you open yourself. Yes. That's the essence. If your identity is larger, even if your consciousness doesn't rise, at least your way of thinking will be a little more better, you know? It's, it's rather like walking out of a prison cell, you can, at least you can see the cell. Yes, at least uh, you could live in the prison yes. instead of the cell. Yes. Solitary confinement is one thing, <laughs> at least walking around in the prison yard is different, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is why you participated in the Davos meeting this year and why you've been a delegate to the UN Millennium uh, Peace Summit. It, it really, you know, to try and open up people to the, your ideas. That's the effort. These are not my ideas. This is life, isn't it? Mm. Well, your exposition of these ideas. <laughs> it is uh, just that we have been working with masses in a big way for the last twenty-five years now. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think the leadership needs to be worked at working through the masses and bringing it up, the consciousness, is going to be a very hard way. We have done that in certain parts of India in a very big way. But uh, I believe the leadership in the world, political, economic and otherwise, whatever kind of leadership, if some change happens in the way they think and feel about life around them, mm -hmm. they can bring about a massive change everywhere. So, I'm very much focused on that now for the last three years. Do, what are your plans for the future? Are you going to continue in this way or have you got other ideas? You, are you going the to future, one thing that I see is the political leadership in the world and the top-level economic leadership who decide the course of the planet in many ways. Mm. I think they must begin to spend some time about their own way of being. They are coming from such limited identifications and they are functioning with such limited focus which can lead to a disaster. So in the name of economic well-being, we are taking ourselves to an ecological disaster. This has only happened because there's no visionary approach, there's just narrow, short-term approaches. This is happening in the political leadership, economic leadership, everywhere. All the leadership is functioning like this. I think and we are striving to somehow influence the political and economic leadership so that they don't think short-term quarterly balance sheet basis, they really look long term, nor are they thinking of four years or five years of their term, they're really thinking long term globally. Because today science and technology is empowered in such a… W as in such a way, it is a boon and it's a possibility of a disaster. If we are sensible, it's a boon. If we are senseless, it's a worse disaster. So if human intelligence itself becomes a problem, that's a real disaster, isn't it? Do you think we've actually got proper leaders today? Do you think we've got real leaders who can make a change, make a difference? See, I don't believe that uh, some ideal leader will come one day. Mm. It is just that if we work on the leaders, my capability is it doesn't matter what kind of a person you are, if you are willing to give me a little bit of time, I will see that your way of thinking, feeling, understanding and perceiving life itself, I will alter for you. <laughs> so we are working in the prisons with hardcore criminals. People who have been branded as real hardcore and have been locked up for life and just see the incredible change in them. So I don't think they're a wrong type of people anywhere in the world, it's just that they have not done the right things yet <laughs> and they're capable of doing right things with a, with a little bit of nudging and a little bit of understanding. Well, thank you very much indeed. This has been Andrew Palmer for podcastforlife.com. 
You can find out more about Sadhguru at sadguru.org. Sadhguru is spelt S-A-D-H-G-U-R-U or at istafoundation.org. Ista is spelt I-S-H-A. Thank you for listening.